All right, certainly appreciate uh, everyone attending tonight. Uh, it's, it's always a, a joyous occasion to be able to engage in Bible study with those of like precious faith and Hopefully, I'll be up to the task that you may learn something that will be uh, useful to you uh, in your uh, own personal studies. <clears throat> Before we start, though, let's uh, have a short word of prayer. If you bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we ask that they'll bless this study of, of uh, ours as we better prepare ourselves to delve into the deep truths of the gospel and what thou would have us to know. We're grateful for the power of the gospel uh, to save us from our sins. And we're grateful for the hope that we have through Jesus Christ, whose uh, love for us led him to the cross, that, him, that there he could shed his blood, that through that blood we might have forgiveness of sins. So bless us as we study and we, we uh, give the all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Of course, we're in a study of uh, logic, and, and it's as it applies to the uh, Bible. <clears throat> and I noticed that <clears throat> uh, Eric was speaking on or taking his uh, verses out of the eleventh chapter of Hebrews. And if you don't understand implication, you'll never understand that. So. Uh, Logic is a very important thing. You know, we, we left off last time talking about the laws of thought, and we got down uh, into the uh, the law of contradictions. And, you know, commonly we just call them laws, but they're probably be more accurately des described as axioms. An axiom is just a truth that it's, it's, um, doesn't require proof. Everybody accepts it to be true. So we stopped off uh, last time with, uh, we had uh, finished up with uh, the law of contradiction. And uh, uh, this is from Brother uh, uh, <laughs> get his name. <laughs> anyway, you know what I'm talking about. That we, uh, that's a Biden moment. Anyway, Hello, this, Dan? Yeah. Our uh, request was if he could kind of increase the font. It's very difficult to read right now. Increase the font. Okay. Typically hold down your shift key and ro rotate your mouse wheel. Well, it doesn't want to do that. Um, let me see. No, it's not going to do. Let's see. In the bottom right hand corner, there's a plus sign, he says. Oh, yeah. Had my iced tea covering that up. Is that better? Much better. Okay, sorry for the uh, delay. We talked about the law of contradiction, you know, uh, nothing can have and not have a given characteristic in precisely the same respect. And you know, when we get into this, we won't deal with things so much. We'll deal with uh, propositions. So so no proposition can be both true and false, false at the same time. Uh, Brother Warren gets down to the uh, thoughts on the importance of the law of contradiction. Uh, you know, it says no one is indifferent to argument and evidence. 
uh, anybody that is can't rightly uh, claim to be interested in truth. You, you can't be indifferent to that and claim to be interested in truth. And we all know that uh, uh, we've run across people that would claim to, you know, this is your truth and I have my truth and talking about the same thing and two different uh, types of truth and both, they're contradictory. Maybe uh, both are wrong, but uh, both cannot be right. Of course, you may recall that uh, uh, Brother Warren had a, a debate with uh, Warren Flu, and uh, that is recorded. You can you can access that uh, on a YouTube like deal, and and you can view that. The only problem you, that I have with it, is I. I I get so tired of listening to Dr. Flu. He's uh, great on my nerves. But anyway, <clears throat> but he said this, you know, he was engaged in that debate with uh, uh, Brother Warren. And he said, uh, whenever and wherever I tolerate self contradiction, and he found out what self contradiction was when he in that debate, he said, then and there I make it evident either that I do not care at all about truth or at any rate, I do not care about something else. Or I do care about something else more. So it was thus precisely because to affirm the premises of a valid deductive argument. And, and that's really what we'll deal with is deductive arguments, not the inductive. Uh, while denying the conclusion is by definition uh, a valid deductive argument to contradict yourself. And what uh, Socrates said, we must follow the argument wherever it leads. It'd be nice for that to happen. But so uh, Brother Warren says, uh, any honest person uh, has to admit that no one really cares about truth, can tolerate uh, self-contradiction. You can't, can't abide by it. So uh, no one is, uh, who is sincerely interested in truth can be indifferent evidence or argument or to self-contradiction. And we yeah, he'll get into this later and we'll eventually cover that. Uh, no one who's sincerely interested in truth will reject the crucial role of the law of implication or inference. And we're going to get into that uh, a little bit later too. Ordinarily, uh, many reject the law of identity and the law of implication and our inference, uh, doggedly hold to a doctrine which the principles of logic show to be false. So they just simply reject logic. And that's, uh, that's uh, you know, First Thessalonians uh, 521 to prove all things or test all things. It makes it look kind of foolish. So as I say, we'll later get uh, into the uh, principle of the inference and implication uh, more in depth a little bit later. So it's uh, self-evident, and that's what an axiom is, is self-evident. It's self-evident that no proposition can be both true and false in the same respect. See, even small children, they can't be convinced their tricycles are both uh, in the house and out of the house at the same time. You know, you don't have to instruct them about logic and they're not going to accept that because they can see logic in the, the way that they uh, have grown up and, and learned to interact with the uh, world. The uneducated, they know that it uh, simply cannot be the case that a baseball is both black all over and not black all over at one and the same time. And that would be contradictory. Everyone knows this to be true. We all know it to be true. So uh, Brother Warren wonders, and, and so should we, why do some people um, at times reject both the law of contradiction and the law of implication and or inference? 
And David Hume, uh, Hume who's a, he's a philosopher, not a Christian, said he uh, hit the nail on the head when he affirmed that no one ever turns against reason until reason uh, turns against him. He said he was saying that uh, no one really rejects the valid reason reasoning, and we have to determine whether it is in fact valid. Uh, that includes implication, inference, and contradiction, and so forth. Until he faces the truth, which is unpleasant to him, that the hard facts of logic make clear that the doctrine which he wishes to espouse and embrace is false. So uh, the clear implications of doctrine which they teach uh, prove the doctrine to be false and they uh, that's the trap they fall into when they reject logic. So he concludes uh, and he has pointed out in chapter 3, and we'll get to that. Uh, all people should recognize the truth of and honor the law of rationality. And uh, that is, men should only draw conclusions as are warranted by the evidence. <clears throat> so, uh, as been pointed out here, all men should recognize the truthfulness of and honor the laws or axioms of thought uh, law of identity, law of excluded middle, and the law of contradiction. And you can't understand the Bible and you can't understand much of anything without complying with these uh, axioms. In, in 1 John 4, 1, we're, we're instructed to try the spirits because all spirits are not the same. And it will be the case that you have a, uh, an evil spirit They'll try to persuade you, just like the the uh, serpent in the garden persuaded Eve that the fruit was good to eat and pleasant looking and tasted good, make her uh, wise. So <clears throat> that's uh, you, know, you know that is what's going to happen when somebody doesn't try the spirits and uh, anybody that's proclaiming a doctrine is a, is a spirit proclaiming something they purport to be God's will. If you, if you don't test that, you don't try those spirits, you can easily fall into error. So it says it would be impossible to obey that instruction, that is to try the spirits or to prove all things even. It would be impossible to obey that if without these laws because no one would know that two propositions which are contradictory of one another were not both true or both false. And if both were true, then the teacher of uh, neither one uh, would be a false teacher, but somebody's got to be false. So one's a false teacher, but if you uh, take the position that it yeah, you got your truth and I got my truth, then neither one of us can be wrong, even though we take uh, contradictory positions on a particular issue. If the law of contradiction is not true, then um, you can't tell a true teacher from a false teacher or a false messiah from a true messiah. You just can't do it. So this is uh, shown to be the case, and uh, those that assume such an irrational uh, position, still, I mean, among those uh, of the church, still use, and whenever it suits their case, do so, use the truth that it is impossible for two propositions which contradict each other to both be true. They know that. But they ignore it. If they would be consistent and uh, always recognize the necessity of logic in general, they and the truth of the laws of thought or axioms of thought, then they would give up many of the errors which they espouse. But they don't. And here's the benefit of knowing logic 
and how to recognize when somebody is uh, espousing and trying to propagate a false argument. Now, we want to, uh, you know, we talked about uh, words have meaning and so forth. And I want to uh, go into some of that uh, here. And we get into definitions, and there's, again, this is something that we all know. We may not have systematized it uh, in a formal way, but we know th these things, and these things that I'm going to go over, you know, you'll recognize them. You, you may not have never heard the terms, but you, you'll recognize them. So we want to uh, go over uh, those things. So we want to look at the purposes and types of definition. And uh, involved in uh, definitions are terms and uh, words and terms and so forth. And we said before that a word has to have meaning. And we often have said that words are conveyances of thought, but they have to have meaning. If they're just gibberish, then they have no meaning to anyone. But a term is a concept with a precise meaning. And we talk about preci precision in, in meanings. It's a precise meaning expressed by uh, one or more words. So a single term can be expressed by uh, many different words. And words which are exact synonyms represent the same term. The English word. Uh, girl and the Spanish word chica uh, represent the same term. Similarly, a single word can represent different terms. Uh, and if you study English to any great extent compared to the other languages, you'll see there's a lot of, of that in English. So, the, for example, the word mad can either mean angry or insane. And you can think of any number of other words, English words, that have a different meaning. So sometimes you, you can't just give the word, you have to go in and uh, give the meaning of it. But a definition is a statement that gives the meaning of a term. The ability to define terms accurately is a valuable skill and logic. Now, just in casual conversation, we don't always do this because uh, we may just give a, a brief definition or just say the word and given the context of conversation, casual conversation with uh, someone else. And, you know, they, they know what you mean. So it's not always necessary to go into a formal uh, definition. But it's a valuable skill to have, uh, nevertheless. And, and uh, lawyers, if you ever get into uh, legal documents, you have to be very precise in your uh, terminology. And I've uh, dealt with this uh, over the years in, in writing legal documents. And, and you have to uh, not only be precise in what you say, but you have to think about what the audience is going to gather from your uh, definition so you have to be very precise and and lawyers uh, will come up with documents that they use over and over again because been been tested in courts and proven to be uh, defensible so they don't like to change that but that's true uh, with any technical language language can you imagine a uh, engineering design deal where the, nobody knew the terms you were talking about and somebody was trying to uh, duplicate a design based on your writing and and no telling what they had come up with. But this the same is true for teachers and scientists, philosophers, uh, even theologians, debaters, and, and most others discussing almost any topic. You have to be a precise if it's a very a formal setting, you have to be very precise in your definitions and you have to know that the other party knows 
what you mean by your definition. So what are the, uh, what do definitions uh, do? You know, how, what do they provide and so forth? So definitions show uh, relationships. When a term is defined uh, properly, uh, the definition also gives some idea of a relationship which the uh, term has with uh, other terms. If you want to say, uh, define man as a rational animal, your definition, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, your definition implies that man has some relationship to other uh, rational beings or uh, not that animals are rational but it it, it uh, gives a relationship to other uh, beings and uh, if your definition implies that man has some relationship to other rational beings uh, such as angels and demons but maybe not uh, other animals, bears and whales and, and lizards and toad frogs and fire ants, you know. But if bald, the word bald is defined as having uh, no hair, it's contradictory, contradictory relationship uh, with the word hairy, uh, is uh, is readily uh, apparent. You, you know immediately what it is, but you have to define ball first as to what it is. Also, uh, definitions remove ambiguity. See, words are ambiguous when they have more than one possible meaning. Meaning, just as we showed with the word uh, mad or girl, uh, the result is a verbal, or can be a verbal disagreement uh, that may be cleared up by defining terms. And that's why it's important in a debate to explicitly state what you mean by a word or a term. You don't want to be arguing about uh, entirely different things when you don't think you are. So a definition that shows relationships or, or reduces ambiguity uh, it, by providing a single established meaning of a term is called a lexical, lexical definition. You go to a dictionary and find out what is that term, how that term is commonly used and, and generally uh, everyone will accept that definition. Yeah, unless you're from East Texas, then it can be entirely different. <clears throat> this is a sort of uh, definition, of course, one finds in, in a dictionary. Or uh, uh, for example, let me see if I can find an example. Um, Some people believe that uh, Jesus' command to love your enemies is absurd. And of course, they're defining love and enemies and so forth uh, to believe it's some kind of a mushy sort of love. Uh, they take that to mean that the other person is a, a nice person. You believe the other person is a nice person. Well, they may not be. But biblically, love means to do that or, or have the best interest of that other person in mind and you uh, want that for them. Of course, the best thing that is uh, can ever result for them is salvation. So if this definition made clear, uh, people that may think that the clan is, is impossible, at least uh, they may still think it's impossible, but at least they don't think it's absurd.
definitions also uh, reduce vagueness. <clears throat> and this is uh, very similar to ambiguity. A term is vague when its extent is unclear. So a term may have a single understood meaning, uh, but there are gray areas where it is uncertain if the given term applies. Uh, for example, it's warm outside. Now, I don't know if it is, not I have to go check, but it's warm outside. Uh, you know, but what does warm outside mean? It's uncertain uh, how warm it is. Like I say, generally, just casual conversation, you don't need to be that specific. But if this were some sort of uh, debate, you're going to say it's warm outside, then you need to be uh, very clear about the temperature. So if you say it's warm outside, then you define that as it's 80 degrees Fahrenheit outside, then there's no doubt about it because uh, hopefully your opponent knows what Fahrenheit is. But anyway, that makes it clear. And then this uh, type of clarification is called a precising definition because it makes more uh, precise what was previously vague. <clears throat> Definitions increase the vocabulary. And I've always said that um, one should read uh, many different things uh, that really are beyond their comfort zone because by doing so they not only learn the uh, different styles of writing but they also learn definitions because I can tell you that people are going to use words you've never heard of so if you've got a dictionary by your side and you look up the definition of a word that someone uses that you've never heard before that definition will increase your vocabulary. You, you'll remember the context in which you, you found it. And when you uh, come across a situation where that context applies, you may use that word yourself. Then you let somebody else go look it up. So uh, when a new word is invented uh, or an existing word is applied in a new way, it is given a stipulative definition. We stipulate that this word is going to mean uh, this. So, you know, new words, are, I mean, English is, a, it embraces everything, every language uh, under the sun. It will uh, embrace languages that you thought it would never embrace, like Russian, tro troika. You ever heard of the word troika? That's a Russian word. And it requires to a uh, uh, kind of a buggy type deal with three horses in the front. Troika means three. So, but that can come over to uh, English or kiosk. Kiosk is not a, it's, it's a come from a, a foreign language. And we adopted that. And there's, there's some words that are just absolutely new. They're not, they don't come from any other language. They, they're, uh, manufactured term. I'm presently using my laptop computer. Well, laptop didn't exist. The word didn't exist before 1985. So that came into existence. Now we need we think nothing about it. In the baseball, there's a certain pitch called a screwball. I'm not exactly uh, what that is, but that came into existence in 1928. And uh, like I say, we get the uh, words from other languages like macho, uh, that's Spanish, of course, but that came in in 1928 also. And you ever heard of the word boondoggle? <laughs> that didn't come from anybody. It was just an invented word. It came from a, a Boy Scout master, master and in 1957. I don't know the context and what they came about, but nevertheless, uh, that's where it came from. So that's a stiff uh, definition. It's a new word. 
and somebody stipulated that it's going to mean this. The definitions can explain concepts theoretically. So sometimes definitions are given for, ter uh, for terms, uh, not because the word itself is unfamiliar, because the term is not understood. Uh, such concepts require uh, theoretical definitions. Yeah, they may be uh, scientific or philosophical in nature. Well, sometimes, uh, say in chemistry, when they say uh, this substance is H2O, well, that's a chemical formula for water. He's not trying to increase your vocabulary because you already know what water is. So he's just uh, explaining the, the theory behind, in this case, the, the uh, chemical formula behind the thing we know is, is water. And definitions can also uh, influence attitudes. So often terms are not defined, uh, not necessarily for the purpose of, or, or terms are defined, and not necessarily for the purpose of clarifying their meanings, but to influence attitudes and emotions. And I know what you're thinking, that this is what politicians do, and yes, they do. So such definitions aim at persuading the listener one way or another towards the term being defined and are therefore called persuasive uh, definitions. And uh, let's uh, give uh, some examples. Uh, is democracy mob rule? And that's what the Greeks uh, thought of it as. And, and whenever they had a, a town meeting, everybody would come to a stadium or something like that, and all of them would get together, and then they call that uh, democracy. I should say they, they engage in that, but the uh, founding fathers of this country uh, understood that to be a governing by the mass, the mob, and they didn't want that. So a democracy was not established in this country. It was a representative form of government. So uh, and today, I don't think this is so much among us, but uh, marriage, that's the institutionalized uh, institution of marriage. Is that a form of slavery? Or is that the uh, blessed union of a man and a woman? Blessed, blessed by God, blessed by God. So, and of course we can get into, you know, uh, abortion and finding a, a fetus as just a blob of mass or a human beings. So one party, uh, defines it one way and one part of the other way, all intended to uh, be persuasive. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of these uh, persuasions, one way or the other, again, one can be false and one can be true, can be both be false. But typically, they can't both be true in the same sense. Now, Another way of uh, uh, characterizing uh, meaning or uh, definitions and so forth, and we'll spend some time with this. And again, this is something that you know. You may have never heard of it described this way, but you know this. And that is the uh, classification of things as a uh, genus, and species. Now, one thing you should not have in your mind that this is referring to taxonomic categories, or it's not talking about that, at least not directly. In 
definition statements and, and terms and what have you, uh, terms are often uh, placed in a genus. Uh, that's a class of things that have common characteristics and then that can be divided into subordinate kinds. And this is just a standard uh, dictionary or lexical definition, if you will. And a species, in logic anyway, is a, is a group subordinate to the genus and containing individuals agreeing in some common uh, attributes and called by a common name. And probably the best way to uh, define this is look at, a, at our hierarchy of genus and species. And let's look at this, if I can make it larger. Uh, I think you can see that now. We got food. Now that's a genus. And what's included in food? Well, we can go quite extensively here. Meats, dairy products, fruits, vegetables, and grains. And meats, dairy products, fruits, and vegetables and grains are the species of the genus food. But the uh, thing that you should note about this, note about this, that the species of food can also be the genus of species below it, like dairy products. That's a genus to the butter, cheese, cream, milk, and what other dairy products you can think of. In grains, that's the genus of wheat, barley, and rye. But in grains is also the species of food. And dairy products is a species of food also. So something can be both a genus of things below it, and a species can be a genus of the things below it. So these are uh, relative terms, that is, one relates to the other. And, and if you uh, I uh, can think about this genus, uh, the things, it always points to things underneath it. Species always points to the thing above it. Again, don't confuse this with the biological terms. It's, there are, in, in logic, there are no other levels than the genus and species. But we're talking about logic, so let's uh, look at the uh, logic. And let me, if we were to look at the uh, logic, there's two forms of logic. And there are only two forms of logic. There's informal logic and formal logic. There are no, are no other kinds of logic. So uh, logic has only two species. In formal logic, uh, doesn't have any species. Formal logic has uh, inductive uh, logic and deductive logic. And, and we're going to be dealing mostly with deductive logic. It's propositional type of logic, syllogisms and what have you. Inductive really has to do with experimental sciences, chemistry, physics, and things like that, where you make observation and you make a, uh, uh, some sort of a, a supposition on the basis of those observations and try to repeat those things. And, and, and so you're, you're inducing that something's going to happen on the basis of experiments or observations. So that's, that's what we're going to be dealing with, uh, uh, primarily formal logic, deductive formal logic, and we may get into informal logic later because, uh, you know, there'd be some people that would engage in informal logic errors and so forth. So we want to do that. But we'll, we'll stop here and we'll make some more, just more examples of genus and 
species and we'll give some where uh, it's just wrong. The, the uh, tree that's given here is, uh, for some of these is just wrong and we'll show you how they can be wrong. But this is something that you go through when you're uh, thinking about these terms. You will go through this, uh, at least maybe in the background, but you will go th through these things and you will categorize these in this uh, this way. So again, appreciate it. We'll we'll take up here, uh, continue this uh, study of genus and species. And once we get the concept down, we may not deal with it much after that. So thank you for your kind attention and we'll conclude here and start next week.